people who introduce speakers very often paint pictures that are bigger than life. And I'm afraid that I was painted bigger than life. As you can see, I'm just, I'm not very tall. I'm not bigger than life. I don't really have all those wonderful qualities that were spoken of. But, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's very kind of them to be so generous. And I really appreciate it. And I particularly appreciated the remarks about my writings about sexist language because I must say that I can't recall ever having been introduced with that as a theme, except when I have given lectures on a few occasions about sexist language. But other than those occasions, it's never brought up. And it's, it's really true that I have devoted an enormous amount of time to thinking and writing about sexist language. Not only the uh, two chapters in the book, Metamagical Themas, or in German, Metamagicum, um, but also I once spent a full year working with a very close friend uh, on a, a novel about sexist language. And uh, it, it turned, or sexism in general, not just sexist language. And it turned out that uh, the book never got published. I'm proud of it. It's the only time I've ever participated in the writing of a novel, but it was really a very intense and wonderful experience. Maybe someday it'll be published. I don't know. Uh, so it, it is nice to be for that for me to hear that reaction to my writings on, on sexist language, and I really appreciate it. And I, I will also say, I, I know this is all in advance of the talk itself, but I have to say a couple of things. One is that I had for 22 years in my research group um, an administrative assistant, a, a wonderful uh, woman named Helga Keller, who came from the Köln area, and uh, she grew up, she's German, and she grew up not far from, from Köln. She died, unfortunately, very unexpectedly uh, seven years ago. And uh, so I, I, I feel that this lecture is being given in her honor, this lecture and the next one. And uh, Helga Keller, and, or Helga Thomas Keller, actually, because her name was Helga Thomas when she grew up and um, a wonderful person, and I, my children and I uh, very deeply miss her. The other thing that I wanted to say is that by a kind of a strange coincidence, this lecture is, as you know, about machine translation, as it says, well, it doesn't really say it up there, it sort of says it indirectly, but um, it's about machine translation, and it so happens, well, this lecture is, is, is focusing on the translation by uh, one particular machine translation program, namely Google Translate, probably the most well-known of all of the currently uh, available machine translation programs. But it happens that in Köln, there is a, um, a firm named DeepL that is produce, ha has produced a rival to Google Translate that often does better than Google Translate. And although, I, I think, is there anyone here from DeepL? Did anyone from DeepL turn up at this lecture? If not, then shame on you. You should have. Uh, I mean, they really should have come. But I was going to say, in case they did come, they would be very happy to see how much I trash Google Translate. <laughs> However, on the other hand, their program is only a little bit better. So, <laughs> but uh, anyway, we'll, 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 we'll come to that in a moment. But it is very interesting. You can look it up on the web, Deep L, D-E-E-P, the lowercase letters, capital D, lowercase E-E-P, capital L. Anyway, now well, let's get to the lecture. When I was originally asked for the title of my lecture, I, I don't know, I gave something boring like concerning machine translation. But uh, I didn't know exactly what I would be saying. But of course, in the meantime, I prepared it very carefully. 
And I decided to give it a more colorful title, uh, The Parthenon, Wang Wei, Little John, The Hamburger, Franz Grillparzer, and The Emptiness of MT. So <laughs> let us begin with a, with a, uh, a philosophical question. It concerns the Parthenon, as you could see at the beginning. Mm, so, a simple true or false question, and then we'll, ask, and we'll actually ask two questions that are analogous to each other. First, did I read Crime and Punishment when I was in high school? Of course I did. Although I read it in English. Have I ever been in the Parthenon? Of course although I was in it in Tennessee. There is the Parthenon in Athens. There is the Parthenon in Tennessee. I was somewhere in there. So, have I been there or not? Well, if I visit a Parthenon reconstructed halfway around the globe, can I validly claim I've been in the Parthenon? Probably not. And if I read a translation of Crime and Punishment in English or German, can I validly claim I've read the novel itself? Pro hopefully so. That's what we always say when we're asked, have you read Crime and Punishment? We all, of course, we say, I read it in high school. Don't even think about the fact that it was a translation. So what's the difference? Is there a difference? And I think this is a, a lovely way of, of phrasing the question, a very serious question. What is translation? Well, etymologically bringing across. So what can bringing across accomplish? I'm going to give you some examples that have to do with human translation first so that we can see some nice examples of translation. We have to have some kind of, um, I don't know what you would call it, point of reference, let's say. So let's talk about Wang Wei, a Chinese poet uh, from these dates. Here is a very famous poem. It's called Lu Jai. That, what that means is roughly deer fence or deer enclosure. And um, Wang Wei had a, a kind of a, a place where he lived that had a lot of land, and it included some kind of hill, or possibly a mountain, I don't really know. Uh, and uh, so the poem was written about this area, which was called by him Lu Jai. So here is the poem, and it, it uh, Lu Jai, and it goes, it's, it's read this way, vertically. I mean, today in Chinese, it's not often that you read vertically, although still sometimes. But uh, so let's let's go over it. Kong Shan Bu Jian Ren, Dan Wen Ren Yu Xiang, Fan Ying Ru Shan Lin, Fu Zhao Qing Tai Shang. Now, uh, I'm sure you've all appreciated the beauty of this poem, but um, but I will give you uh, for those few of you who may not have understood it. I will give you uh, a, uh, a, oops, come on, uh, a word-for-word -word rendition written not vertically but horizontally, Dear Manor. Okay, uh, it may not make a lot of sense to you in this form, but we're now going to see, then we're going to see some good translations of it. So, empty hill, not see person, but hear person language sound. Return shadow, enter deep forest. Again shine green moss on. Okay, that may not sound like it makes a great deal of sense, but uh, what we're going to do is look at some translations made by people, highly thoughtful people, uh, some versions that are trying to make an equivalent little poem in the English language. So let's take a look. Here's one that was done in the 20s, 100 years ago or something. Deer Park Hermitage. There, I might say that some of these, not all of them, were taken from uh, a book called 19 Ways of Looking at Wang Wei. And uh, it's a little book, and it's a very nasty book, because it was written by somebody who hates 
the translations that have been published. He tears them apart. His name is Elliot Weinberger, and he hates the translators, and he hates the translations, and he mocks them mercilessly. It's a very nasty book. Nonetheless, if you ignore what he says and just take the poems, you can enjoy them and think they're pretty good, uh, despite the fact that he tears them apart. So if you're interested in seeing more translations of this poem, just buy yourself the book, 19 Ways of Looking at Wang Wei. Uh, so anyway, let's take a look. There seems to be no one on the empty mountain, and yet I think I hear a voice where sunlight, entering a grove, shines back to me from the green moss. Now, um, what can I say about this? It, 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 it's, uh, th there is nothing in the original that says there seems to be. However, well, it's okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, it gives a nice impression, line by line, of what this poem is about. Shines back to me from the green moss. You understand that, you understand the whole thing pretty clearly. Now, I, might, I, I could go back and point out that uh, there is a rhyme right here, uh, Ren and Lin, sort of rhyme, and uh, Xiang and Shang, sort of rhyme, and so they're sort of partial rhymes, um, and um, so th that is somewhat imitated here, at least in part with voice and moss. So there's a little bit of that structure as well. Now let's go on. Here's one, another one I don't remember when it was made. Deer Park, hills empty, no one to be seen. We hear only voices echoed, with light coming back into the deep wood, the top of the green moss is lit again. Now, there may be a, a, an attempt at rhyme here with seen and again, I don't know, and echoed and wood, maybe. So there you have two rhymes, if so, S two partial rhymes, not exactly a, B, A, B, but here it's A, B, B, A, but still, it's nice. Um, here it's we, and in the previous poem it was I. In the original Chinese there was no pronoun. So it's kind of interesting, maybe that's what English requires, who knows. Uh, let's go on. Here's one, uh, the deer park. Not the shadow of a man on the deserted hill, and yet one hears voices speaking. Deep in the seclusion of the woods, Stray shafts of the sun pick out the green moss. These lines are quite long, considering that the, the length of the Chinese, uh, the Chinese was only five syllables per line. This is a, lo a long line. This is a pretty long line. But, okay, whatever. And here the pronoun is one. There's no pronoun in here, but there's a one here. I mean, one could try to analyze these to death. I'm not going to try to do it. What I'm really trying to do is just to show you a variety of different translations. You can judge them for yourself and see what you think of them. I'm not trying to tell you what you should think of them because I don't know. Um, I, I enjoy them all. I, I, I think they have their virtues and their weaknesses. Uh, Dear Forest Hermitage. Through the deep wood, the slanting sunlight casts motley patterns on the jaded green mosses. No glimpse of man on this lonely mountain, yet faint voices drift on the air. And this one is curious because it reverses. These are the first two lines, and these are the last two lines. And why in the world was that done? Well, it's a, it's a human choice. F somehow, the, the translators decided that that was a better poem in English. I'm, I'm not criticizing it, really, I'm not. I, I think it's fascinating. And let me also point out, since we're talking about sexist language, that almost all of them replace the word ren in Chinese, which means person, with the word man. And they don't even think about it. I don't know if any of you thought about it either. And that's a very serious point that talks about the nature of sexist language and the subtlety of it. Um, it goes right by without your even thinking about it. I'm not going to dwell on that, but I'd just like to point it out since it was brought up earlier. Here's one that takes seven lines to do four lines. Why? I, I, again, I'm not criticizing it. I think it's very, very fascinating. And while we're on the topic of, um, I don't know, while we're on the topic of translation of poetry, I guess, um, it's interesting. The original poem had this nice rectangular shape, which is pretty, 
This one, look at this nice shape. I mean, it, I, it, you know, it, it's very pretty. It's a kind of a, a nice form. I, I mean, it wouldn't look so pretty if I hadn't centered all the lines, of course. <laughs> but, you know, you, have to, you just have to say that's a nice feature of this poem. Now, let's read it. Deep in the mountain wilderness. That's Lu Jai. <laughs> a lot of syllables. Deep in the mountain wilderness where nobody ever comes, only once in a great while, something like the sound of a far-off voice. The low rays of the sun slip through the dark forest and gleam again on the shadowy moss. By the way, I didn't mention it, but this uh, low rays of the sun, it really is about the, the late afternoon sunlight coming in nearly horizontally through the trees. Uh, and bouncing off of the moss. So that's a very good image that is given here, and probably in the others. I wasn't thinking about it earlier. Now, this is uh, by a wonderful Indian writer. You may have heard of him, Vikram Seth, who wrote... Uh, I won't go into it. He's too many things to say about Vikram Seth. He, he's a wonderful writer. Let's suffice it to say that. Um, and he spent three years of his life in China, and so he learned to speak Chinese, and he fell in love with uh, Chinese poetry, classical Chinese poetry, and he has a book out of po uh, translations of uh, classical Chinese poetry, and this is taken from that book. So, empty hills, no man in sight, just echoes of the voice of men. In the deep wood, reflected light shines on the blue-green moss again. Notice the beautiful rhyme here. And the nice rhyme here, except for this and this. We have sexist language once again. There it is. Can't help that. Well, you can help it, but he didn't help it. Um, he, so anyway, um, it's, but it is, aside from that blight, it's a very nice translation. These all involve huge amounts of thought about the meaning of the Chinese text about the form of the Chinese text, about poetic traditions in the English language, about how form and content interact, about Wang Wei's life and times, and so on. Every line of every translation involved innumerably many deeply subjective judgments, and that's certainly true. Each one's lovely in its own way. But has any English language reader of any of these poems, even of all of these poems, actually stood in the Parthenon of Wang Wei's original poem? What do you think? Well, I don't want to vote, but it's a question. Now we come to MT. Could there be a perfect translation, a perfect one, that would get us to stand in the Parthenon? Machine translation founded in 1947 by the American mathematician and statistician uh, Warren Weaver. He was also a great fan of translation. And he wrote the following weird statement, which I don't know how seriously he took, but he wrote it, and this was what launched the field of machine translation. When I look at an article in Russian, I say, this is really written in English, but has been coded in some strange symbols. I will now proceed to decode. Well, if that were really the case, then you, decoding always gives you the right answer. Decoding is a precise process that yields the exact right answer. So if translation is really a form of decoding, then there must be a right answer. It must be the perfectly correct answer. Long years of struggle followed. In 1959, this is about 12 years later, um, a very famous Israeli uh, mathematician, logician, linguist, Yehoshua Bar Hillel, wrote a technical report, and it was called A Demonstration of the Non-Feasibility of Fully Automatic High-Quality Machine Translation, which, stand, which is, this is this F-A-H-Q-M-T, Fully Automatic High-Quality Machine Translation. And he uh, was an advocate of machine translation. He had been working on it for a number of years. But he was also convinced that it was not going to ever really happen. He thought it was a good idea to try to make it happen, 
but he was convinced that it would not happen, and he wrote this report roughly 60 years ago. Here is a little bit of it. The task of instructing a machine how to translate from one language that it does not understand into a different language that it also does not understand presents a real challenge. If, in a translation task, some step has to be taken that depends on the machine's ability to understand the text in question, then the machine will simply be unable to make the step, and so the whole operation will come to a full stop. Now, as it happens, as we know, programs like Google Translate and DeepL's translation engine uh, do not come to a full stop. They continue blithely translating. They make all sorts of decisions, sometimes right and sometimes wrong, but they don't come to a full stop. Um, uh, so, in this sense, this is wrong, but in another sense, it's still quite accurate. We're going to see what Google Translate does, but many programs of this sort do this exact same sort of thing uh, in June of 2018. This is taken, incidentally, from the 1959 article by Yehoshua bar -Hillel, the example that I'm going to give you, the sentences that I'm giving to Google Translate to translate are taken from the 1959 article. Here is the passage. It's the very short. Little John was looking for his toy box. Finally, he found it. The box was in the pen. John was very happy. What does pen mean here? Well, sometimes it means a writing implement, and other times it means a small play area with a fence. Often it's called a play pen. Which does pen mean here? I think you know which it means. So, let's see what happens. This is what I came out with in German. Little John suchte nach seiner Spielzeugkiste. Endlich hat er es gefunden. Die Schachtel war in der Feder. John war sehr glücklich. Now, it's interesting, uh, not only did it get the wrong meaning of pen, but it also, here it says, it clearly understands that this is feminine, but this is neuter, and now it's die Schachtel. It's funny, it's not the Spielzeugkiste, it's die Schachtel. So it's translating it one sentence at a time. It's not paying any attention. This S doesn't refer back to that. It just translated, he found it, and that's that. It has no understanding of what it's doing. Die Schachtel war in der Feder. Or in French, little John cherchait son jouet boîte. Well, of course, that's ridiculous French. Finalement, il l'a trouvé. La boîte était dans le stylo. John était très content. Okay, well, possible objection. Google Translate translates only one sentence at a time, not a whole paragraph. So how dare you slam it for failing when there's no hint given inside the sentence itself? I'm being very bad. I'm being mean. Okay, well, possible reply. One sentence at a time. What an utterly ridiculous, totally misguided, brain-damaged approach to language. That's one possible reply to that objection. Let's give another reply. Let's leave common sense totally out of the picture and just give Google Translate another try. Here's the new single sentence input. Little John was looking for his toy box and when he finally found it, the box was in the pen. One sentence, what do you want? And the new output. Little John suchte nach seiner Spielzeugkiste und als er ihn now it's ihn endlich gefunden hatte, war die Schachtel im Kugelschreiber. Well, didn't do too much better. And don't ask me why it got this ihn. I don't know. Okay. Um, so these are interesting things. Hmm, I guess that's a good reaction. Mm -hmm. Okay. This, the box was in the pen is the most famous sentence in all the history of machine translation. If anybody studies machine translation, they immediately learn about this sentence. They immediately learn 
about Yehoshua Bar Hillel's objections in 1959. And yet, this is the state of the art of machine translation in the spring, or maybe, well, it's still the spring, I guess, uh, of 2018. Pretty interesting. Let me read you Yehoshua Bar Hillel's commentary about his own passage. Why is a translating machine, he's talking about Google Translate, although he doesn't know it, <laughs> powerless to determine the meaning of pen in this sample of text? The explanation is extremely simple. What makes any human reader grasp this meaning so unhesitatingly is knowledge of the relative sizes of toy boxes and pens in the sense of writing implements and pens in the sense of play pens. A little bit more than just the knowledge of the sizes. A lot more than that. It has to do with what we know about children and play pens and toys and toy boxes and a million things. A translating machine has no such knowledge. When I pointed this out to one of my colleagues working on MT, his first reaction was, but why not envisage a system in which the translation machine has such knowledge? Understandable as this reaction is, it is very easy to show its futility. The idea that a translation machine should be supplied not only with a dictionary, but also with a universal encyclopedia is utterly chimerical and hardly deserves any further discussion. That was written in 1959. Now, as you know, today, computers have access to everything on the World Wide Web, every possible thing on the World Wide Web, which is infinitely larger than anything that Yehoshua Bar Hillel could conceivably have imagined. Uh, and yet, we still see that it doesn't help. All the stuff they have access to doesn't help. Empty state-of-the-art means today deep learning. I'm not going to go into the technical details because this is not a talk about how it works. This is a talk about whether it works. Many layered artificial neural networks trained with backpropagation. Just that's more or less accurate. And big data, enormous bilingual databases. I mean, and when I say enormous, I mean, you know, hundreds of millions of pages, uh, billions if not even maybe trillions of words of text. No world understanding is involved. Word disambiguation, such as of the word pen, is made by statistical selection based on context, that is, the surrounding words, not on understanding what the text means. So let's try a second experiment with Google Translate also in June. So let's look, go back to Wang Wei. So here's the original poem just written out as 20 characters in a row. Um, and here is the result of putting it through Google Translate. The empty mountain is not seen, but the people reverberate back into the deep forest to remake the moss. <laughs> Doesn't make much sense. Well, I don't know what to say about that. I don't know. It's interesting to see what it does in German, though. Der leere Berg wird nicht gesehen, aber die Menschen wieder hallen zurück in den tiefen Wald, um das Moos neu zu machen. What's interesting about this is, if you look at the English and look at the German, they're almost identical, which suggests that actually it's not going from Chinese to German. It's going from Chinese to English and English to German. That's what it's probably doing. And it's very interesting that it would do that. It's just uh, kind of mind-boggling, but let's leave that aside. What happens if you add punctuation? Because people often do. Uh, so I put in some commas and some periods. That's all, I just changed it a little bit. Empty mountains are not seen, but people speak loudly. Returning to the deep forest on the moss. Well, I don't know. Leere Berge werden nicht gesehen, aber Leute sprechen laut. Kehre in den tiefen Wald zurück und nimm das Moos. Mm -mm -mm -mm. I don't know. What happens if you break the poem up into four separate lines of text? Leere Bergleute. <laughs> That's a good one, I like that. Aber Leute sprechen laut. Zurück 
den tiefen Wald auf dem Moos. Hmm, I don't know. Well, this is the state of the art of machine translation in 2018. We're not yet standing in the Parthenon. Okay, now, uh, this takes a while to unpack, so let's just go on and you'll see what I mean. A few days after making this experiment, I was told about a supposedly superior MT program produced by the Chinese AI company Tangxun, called Tencent in English. So I thought I had better check it out. I treated the poem as a single chunk, just as I did originally. Here's what Tencent gave me. Empty mountain sees no one, but hears the sound of people coming back into the deep forest to illuminate the moss. Not terribly good, no better than Google Translate. It was claimed to be superior, but it turns out not to be. Then I broke the poem up into four lines. Now I've written it horizontally, four horizontal lines. And I fed them to the 10 cent uh, MT engine one line at a time. And here is what came out. Dear Wood, in pathless hills, no man's in sight, but I still hear echoing sound. So deep in the forest, the sunset glow can cross to shine upon the moss. Hmm. Pretty amazing. But there was something that made me wonder. I don't know, this just sounded... I didn't see anything about pathless hills in the original. Um, you know, I, it, I just thought, this line is so amazing. So I, you know, what do they call it, copy and paste? I copied and pasted it, put, pasted it, put it in between quotation marks, and gave it to Google. Not Google Translate, just Google. And it came up with this poem. By uh, translation by Yuan Xingpei, in pathless hills no man's in sight, but I still hear echoing sound. Oh, look. Ah, ah, I hear echoing sound, yes. Now, the rest of the poem is different. So then I thought, well, let me look at uh, this line. I picked it up again, gave it to Google. And what did I get? Another poem by a different translator. There it is again. There's that one and that one. So, altogether, three lines out of the original poem. Let's see, did I? Oops. Oh, well, you get the idea. Three lines out of the original po out of this poem were, sw were swiped from other people. Yuck. Not nearly what one thought it was at the beginning. Little interlude. What is artificial intelligence? It was founded in the United States and the United Kingdom in the late 40s and early 50s, and it was driven mostly by philosophical goals. And that's why when I became involved in the field in the mid-70s, uh, I was driven by philosophical goals not by anything commercial or practical, just by philosophical goals, like what is thinking? Can computers think? Can computers be conscious? Things like that. Some of the Im important people in that early period were, I'm only going to name two. I mean, I, I'm not going to go into it in any detail, just to, just to comment. Alan Turing, who in 1950 wrote a famous article called Computing Machinery and Intelligence, in which he proposed a way of trying to tell whether an entity, an unknown entity, was genuinely thinking or not, which was to pose it questions in language on an unlimit in an unlimited manner. Uh, you could ask it questions about any topic whatsoever and keep on going and going as long as you wanted. And if after a long period of time it kept on convincing, it, you couldn't tell that it wasn't human, and you don't even know whether you're dealing with a human or a machine, and you finally decide you're dealing with a human, and it turns out you're wrong, you're dealing with a machine, well, then we can say that the machine is thinking. That was the Turing test. Some years later, uh, 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 Josef Weizenbaum, who, who came to the United States and got his doctorate at MIT working on computer models of language, he developed a program called ELISA, which 
uh, interacted with people and was trying to play the part of a, uh, of a psychotherapist. And it would take remarks written, typed out by people and answer them and then the people would reply and then it would reply to them and so forth. It was a dialogue between the program and people. And to Weizenbaum's great surprise and shock, um, people not only thought that the machine understood the language, the English, that they were typing to it, but they really thought that the machine understood their feelings and their problems, their psychological problems. And he knew that the program was a trivial piece of work that had no understanding of language whatsoever, not to mention understanding of people's feelings. And uh, he called this uh, uh, unfortunate uh, side effect, I don't know what you want to call it, this unfortunate fact about his program, the ELISA effect, the idea that people will attribute much, much more to the words that are spat out by a computer program than really they deserve, than the words deserve, because people are not used to anything other than other people using words. And other, what other people, when they use words, there is meaning behind them. And so it's an inevitable, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Inevitable, uh, tend well, uh, what's the word? It's not just tendency, uh, doesn't matter. You get the idea. You can't resist it. It's an it, it's irresistible uh, thing to attribute more meaning than is really there. So these are some of the early things. Over the years, that means 20, 30, 40 years, uh, AI slowly drifted from universities to corporations, and the philosophical goals got forgotten, replaced mostly by commercial goals, as we see in today's AI programs. And floods of hype, or hyperbole, or if you wish, exaggeration, such as the term deep learning and the so-called singularity came about. I'll just comment briefly. Um, the, 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 the term deep learning is hype, that is exaggeration, for the following reason. You know, deep learning is based on what are called deep neural nets. And a deep neural net means a neural net that has many layers. And it's called deep, supposedly, supposedly, because it's not shallow. Shallow would be two or three la layers. Deep would be 12 layers or, or more. Uh, so uh, the people who invented this term can claim, oh, we're being very honest. We're just saying that the neural nets are deep. But do you think they really believe that that's the only meaning that people will associate with the word deep when they hear this term? Obviously not. When you hear deep learning, you don't think, oh, deep network, many layers. You think profound you think something completely different from what they, quote, meant. But they didn't only mean that thing. They wanted the extra meaning of deep to rub off. And in that sense, it's complete uh, misrepresentation and dishonesty, in my opinion. And the predicted singularity, well, if you don't know about the singularity, lucky you. Um, if you do, then you also know that it's probably a lot of hype. It may not be. We don't know yet. We shall see. In any case, there are many sources of confusion today about the nature of artificial intelligence or the level of achievement of artificial intelligence. And there are so many different projects in AI that it's impossible to give a single answer about where we are. There are hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of different projects all over the globe, and they're all doing different things, and some of them are pretty amazing, and some of them are pretty stupid. And, uh, you know, so what we can... Let's, let's just talk a little bit about a few of them. I mean, there are notorious and uh, in, uh, undeniable successes in chess and Go. As you know, 20 years ago, roughly, uh, Gary Kasparov was defeated by Deep Blue in a rather humiliating way uh, in, for the World Championship of chess. And today, you can buy 
very simple programs. I don't mean simple, but I mean you can buy an ordinary. You can just go, you know, on the web and spend a hundred dollars or something and get yourself a program that's better by far than any human player in the world. By far, infinitely better than any human player in the world. That was that's pretty humiliating and pretty shocking and pretty amazing. And maybe it's good. Go was a a, a more even more amazing thing, and just recently, as you know, some of the best players in the world have been beaten, and now probably the best players in the world are hopelessly uh, bad compared with the Go programs that exist. And, and that's pretty amazing. And to me, personally, it may, you may not feel this way, uh, very sad. I, I, I'm always extremely sad about that. But be that as may, it's a fact. Successes in speech recognition. I've color-coded these in different colors because as we go down, the colors are going to be, represent more and more uh, doubt about whether it's really a success. But um, so speech recognition is pretty good. It often understands what people say. Um, often it doesn't, though. And uh, so I won't go into that. Successes in self-driving cars. Well, self-driving cars are somewhat successful, um, but they drive only under limited uh, circumstances, very limited circumstances, and um, we will see how far they get. There's no doubt that they're, that they're, uh, that they're impressive in some ways, and I'm not going to go into that either in this lecture. Uh, but it, it, the dot, dot, dot imit suggests that we're, this is maybe a little bit more dubious than these. The question mark suggests that it's getting even more dubious. Um, successes in music composition. Well, they're, they're the best program that I'm aware of, Emmy, is one that I studied for many years and uh, written by Dave Cope. I'm not going to go into that. Most of the time it produces pieces that make no musical sense at all that are incoherent, but once in a while it comes up with something that's impressive, or I should say it came up, it used to do so, but Dave Cope destroyed the program uh, for some reason, some obscure reason that I certainly don't understand some years ago. Uh, successes in joke creation, well, that idea itself is more or less a joke. <laughs> and then successes in MT. Well, you know, I put three question marks here, but I, my purpose is not to say that MT has achieved nothing. Because, of course, if you have tried it out, you have seen it succeed in all sorts of ways. And so have I. And sometimes they're quite impressive. So I'm not trying to say that it always fails. That three question marks doesn't mean every time you run a piece of text through MT, it, it gives out garbage. I don't mean that. I just mean that you can never know in advance whether it's going to give out garbage or correctness. You don't know because it so often gives out garbage. Let's take a look. Well, since when does plagiarism count as intelligence? That's a pretty interesting question. I mean, that's what, you know, the MT by Tang Shun was doing. I'm sure Google Translate would do it too, if it were able to. Third experiment with Google Translate. My former doctoral student, Melanie Mitchell, uh, who did work with me on analogy making some years ago in Indiana University and University of Michigan, um, is writing a book on today's and tomorrow's artificial intelligence. And one of her chapters is devoted to machine translation. And just only two weeks ago, she sent me um, a, a paragraph that she had written. Uh, now, you may know or you may not know of the famous AI researcher Roger Shank, who in the 60s and 70s was famous for writing um, uh, little stories about somebody who would go into a restaurant and order a hamburger and then get mad when it was overcooked and who would storm out of the restaurant. Melanie made a story, she invented a story herself exactly on that theme and just gave it to Google Translate. So let's take a look, the hamburger. So, here's the original story in the style of Roger Shank. 
And she didn't know in advance what the program was going to do with it. She didn't concoct it deliberately in order to trick the program. She just wrote the story. So let's read it. A man went into... A, can you read it back there? Okay. A man went into a restaurant and ordered a hamburger cooked, ra cooked rare. When it arrived, it was burned to a crisp. The waitress stopped by the man's table. Is the burger okay? she asked. Oh, it's just great, the man said, pushing back his chair and storming out of the restaurant without paying. The waitress yelled after him, Hey, what about the bill? She shrugged her shoulders, muttering under her breath, Why is he so bent out of shape? And if you don't know this idiom, it just means annoyed, very annoyed. It's a standard idiom in modern American English. Okay, so let's look at the French version. Un homme est entré dans un restaurant et a commandé un hamburger cuit rare. Quand il est arrivé, il a été brûlé à un croustillant. La serveuse s'arrêta devant la table de l'homme. « Est-ce que le hamburger va bien » demanda-t-elle. « Oh, c'est génial !» dit l'homme en repoussant sa chaise et en sortant du restaurant sans payer. La serveuse a crié après lui. Hey, « Hé Et le projet de loi ?» Elle haussa les épaules marmonnant dans son souffle. « Pourquoi est-il si, si déformé ?» Now, I could say many things about this. Many, many things. But I think you all got the idea that it's pretty ridiculous. Um, but let's see what I do next. I translated the French into English as faithfully as I could for those people who don't read French. And here is what it says. A man entered a restaurant and ordered a hamburger. Cooked infrequent. Cuit rare. When he arrived, he got burned at a crunchy pretty meaningless. The waitress stopped walking in front of the man's table. Is the hamburger doing well? <laughs> she asked. Notice the capital S, by the way. I mean, what's that all about? Oh, it's terrific, said the man while putting his chair back and going out of the restaurant without paying. The waitress shouted after him, say, what about the proposed legislation? <laughs> she shrugged her shoulders, mumbling in her breath, why is he so distorted? Now, uh, so that gives you a sense of where we are. Um, now here is, I, I took the French and I decided to give this to Google Translate. I gave that to Google Translate. And here's what it came out with. Ein Mann betrat ein Restaurant und bestellte einen Hamburger, der selten gekocht wurde. Als er ankam, war er zu einem Knusprigen verbrannt. Die Kellnerin blieb am Tisch des Mannes stehen. Ist der Burger okay? fragte sie. Oh, das ist großartig, sagte der Mann, schob seinen Stuhl weg und verließ das Restaurant ohne zu bezahlen. Die Kellnerin rief ihm hin hinterher, hey, und die Rechnung? Sie zuckte die Achseln und murmelte etwas vor sich hin. Warum ist er so deformiert? Well, what's interesting about, there are many things interesting about this, but I suppose the most interesting is this word. Where in the world did that come from? Well, I, how did it arrive? It was fed with le projet de loi, and it came out with die Rechnung. Here is a screen, in case you don't believe me, I just gave it that one phrase, and it came out with die Rechnung. How is that possible? Guess how. Le projet de loi translates into English as the bill. A bill as in, a, you know, you give a bill to the Senate and then they vote on it to see if it's going to become a law. That goes to English as the bill, and the bill comes out as die Rechnung. That's how it got from le projet de loi 
zu die Rechnung. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Ay, ay, ay. Okay. Okay, Franz Grillparzer. I decided I was reading this book um, uh, a, a, few, uh, a few months ago, well, almost a year ago. Uh, Der arme Spielmann, written in 1848 by Franz Grillparzer. And for some obscure reason, I decided to see what would happen if I fed some sentences or some passages in that book to uh, Google Translate. And I also translated myself. So I'm going to show you some examples. Here, I'm, here's the original text, uh, very, sh very short. So schritt ich weiter und weiter, von allen Seiten weinen und traurige Leute, suchende Mütter und ihre gehende Kinder. Now, I think you understand that pretty well. This is from toward the end of the book, if you happen to know the book. It's toward the very end of the book. All right, so here's my translation. I kept on walking further. Wherever I turned, mournful sobbing, the grim tolling of bells, desperate mothers, and lost children wandering at random. Notice that I feel free to use my knowledge of the world and my knowledge of my native language to express things in what I think is the most vivid and image-evoking kind of language. I don't feel restricted by the exact words that were used in the original text. I feel comfortable in imagining images that are brought to mind by the words in the German text, and then con converting my imagery, thanks to my years of life on the surface of this planet, into words in my native language. That's how I work when I translate. Google Translate. So I walked on and on, from all sides, crying and mourning, searching mothers and deceiving children. Well, pretty nonsensical. Okay. Uh, I mean, it, it got some success. It got some success and some success. Um, Trauergeläute, as far as I can tell, does not mean mourning, but means bells. So, anyway, let's go on. Endlich kam ich an die Gärtnergasse. Auch dort hatten sich die schwarzen Begleiter eines Leichenzuges aufgestellt, doch, äh, doch wie es schien, entfernt von dem Hause, das ich suchte. Als ich aber näher trat, bemerkte ich wohl eine Verbindung von Anstalten und hin- und hergehenden zwischen dem Traugerleiter und der Gärtnerswohnung. Okay, now here's my version of it. Finally, I came to the Gärtnergasse. There, as in so many other spots, I saw the black-clad members of a funeral cortege that had gathered at a fair distance from the building I was looking for. But as I came closer, I noticed some back-and-forth activity that seemed to link the funeral cortege with the building where the gardener lived. Google Translate. At last I came to the Gärtnergasse. There, too, the black companions of a funeral procession had appeared, but it seemed remote from the house I was looking for. When I approached, however, I noticed a combination of institutions and reciprocations between the tragedy and the garden apartment. What on earth does this mean? A combination of institutions and reciprocations between the tragedy and the garden apartment. It's incomprehensible garbage. Okay. Da hatte er sich wohl verkältet und wie im ersten Augenblick denn keine Hilfe zu haben war, griff er in die Fantasie und wurde immer schlechter und schlechter, ob wir ihm gleich beistanden nach Möglichkeit und mehr dabei litten als er selbst. Denn er musizierte in einem Fort mit der Stimme nämlich und schlug den Takt und gab Lektionen. Now I had read, you have to understand, the entire book. 
This is something that Google Translate can't do. Although, of course, people will say that it read the whole book because it translated it, but it didn't read the whole book and it doesn't know anything about what's going on in the book, but I do. And so when I translate, I feel free to refer to things that I understand about, what's, it's about what is being said. So here's how I translated that passage. In doing that good deed, though, he, felt quite, he fell quite ill. And since, at the time, there was no one to help out, he soon was raving deliriously, and it just grew worse and worse despite all our best efforts. In fact, our suffering was worse than his was. After all, he, at least, kept on making music on his own, just with his voice, and kept on beating out rhythms, even acting as if he were still giving lessons. All of this is because I understand the text. I know what it means. Here is Google Translate. There he had probably chalked up, and as at the first moment no help had to be had, he seized the imagination and became worse and worse whether we at once assisted him as much as possible and he suffered more than himself one with the voice, namely, and beat the beat and gave lessons. Well, it's incomprehensible. Nobody who read that would have the foggiest idea what is going on in any part of that text. The last one. Da nun zu gleicher Zeit die Magd mit der Suppe eintrat und der Fleischer, ohne sich durch den Besuch stören zu lassen, mit lauter Stimme sein Tischgebet anhob, in das die Kinder gellend einstimmten, wünschte ich gesegnete Mahlzeit und ging zur Tür hinaus. So this is at the very, toward the very end of the story. Right then, the daughter brought out the soup and the butcher clearly not wanting to let my visit interfere, started intoning the dinner-time grace, and the two children loudly joined in. Sensing I was out of place, I simply wished them a blessed meal and walked out the door. Now, when I did this, and I sent it out to a few friends, including, you know, mostly German speakers, uh, somebody pointed out to me that I said the daughter, and here, wherever it is, it says, die Magd, and I thought, oh my God, how could I have been so stupid? Why didn't I say the maid? Why did I say the daughter? And I guess I was thinking that I, I know that mocked, you know, used to mean girl. Uh, I mean, today it just means maid, but I was thinking the girl, and I was thinking it's the daughter of the family. But what an idiot I was to say the maid. I felt very ashamed of myself, especially when I looked to see what Google Translate did. When? At the same time, the maid entered the soup, and the Fleischer, without letting himself be disturbed by the visit, raised the banquet in a loud voice, into which the children agreed. I wished for a blessed meal and went out the door. Well, very interesting, it got this right. But then it has the maid entering the soup. Now, I didn't think of that. I must admit, I'm not that creative. I did not think that the maid entered the soup. Uh, and this shows the difference between somebody who understands and some, well, buddy isn't the right word, something that doesn't understand, as Yehoshua Bar Hillel said, things that do understand and things that don't understand. There's a very, very big difference. This is the state of the art. Ye Yehoshua Bar Hillel, back in 1959, only under very exceptional circumstances will MT be able to compete with human translation. The reason is that expert human translators use their background knowledge, mostly subconsciously, in order to resolve ambiguities that machines will either have to leave unresolved or will resolve by some mechanical rule, which every so often will result in a wrong translation. Very prophetic. One last thing, I'm going to give a, a little bit of a what's the word, a um, advance um, uh, advertisement, you might say, for tomorrow's talk. So one final little example of myself as a translator, as contrasted with Google, um, I'm going to again take Kung Shan Bu Jian Ren and so forth, the Lu Jai poem, and talk a little bit about it. 
As, uh, well, sorry. As you know, you've already seen several translations. And I liked some of them. I liked them all in their own way. But I was very confused, or if you wish, surprised, or shocked, or disappointed, or confused. I don't know what word to say. That nobody took seriously the fact that the poem was made of 20 words arranged in a nice pattern, five by four, um, and they were all monosyllabic. It seemed to me to be screaming out, especially once I had read all the translations in, in Elliot Weinberger's book, it seemed to me to be screaming out for a 20-syllable translation. And so I worked hard on it and came up with the following. Bleak peak, spino folk, but hark, hush-like talk, Sunflex pierce dark bosk, flick from high green bark. Now, in case you don't know this word, it means a grove of trees or a forest, a little forest. Um, the point is, I, I might point out that I, I put a lot of words that ended in the k sound into my translation. And why did I do that? I did it very deliberately because Chinese, as you may or may not know, has um, uh, only really two consonants that words can end in, either N or NG. Uh, Mandarin Chinese does. Um, Cantonese has other continent consonants that it can end in, like k, k, a K sound, or a T, or a P, but Mandarin only has N and NG. And uh, so there's a very limited repertoire of sounds, and I wanted to sort of imitate that in my translation, so I have these, all these K sounds all over the place um, just for the fun of it. But that was my translation, and I was proud of myself, and I'm going to talk about it more um, tomorrow. Anyway, what I would call fully analogical, high-quality human translation, which we could abbreviate this way, is not at all like machine translation. Fully analogical high-quality human translation sparkles, scintillates, and tingles throughout. I'm not only referring to myself, mind you, I'm talking about all high-quality human translators. MT's emptiness. Some concluding thoughts. Why is there such a vast difference between getting a computer to be able to play world-class chess or Go and getting a computer to be able to translate very simple sentences, such as the boxes in the pen, reliably. I mean, that's an interesting thing. It can outdo the best people in the world in chess and go, but it can't even do a decent job at all on translating very simple things. Sometimes it does, mind you. I'm not saying that, but sometimes it does, it makes garbage. It is because today's MT, no matter how flashy or deep it is, is empty. It is because today's MT does not have any ideas behind the scenes. It is because today's MT just throws symbols around without any notion that they might symbolize anything. This is today's MT. Notice I always put today's. I'm not talking about what is possible in principle I'm talking about what exists and what the commercial, the drive for commercial success has brought about. I'm not talking about what could be done in theory or in principle. I'm talking about what is being done today. Today's MT mostly reflects corporate goals, not philosophical goals. MT could have been otherwise, and MT might someday become totally different, but today, the fact is that MT has no understanding of situations because it has no understanding of words, because it doesn't know words stand for anything. MT doesn't know what a hill or a voice is, or what green is, or what moss is. MT doesn't know about space. MT doesn't know about time. MT doesn't know about up or down. MT doesn't know about big or little. It knows, uh, no is not the wrong word, it can manipulate the words big, little, up, and down, but it doesn't know what they mean. MT doesn't know there are people. MT doesn't know there are things. MT doesn't know there is a world. 
MT doesn't know that anything exists. MT doesn't know that anything happens. MT doesn't know anything at all. MT isn't roughly understanding or sort of understanding the text it works on. MT is not understanding. MT is empty, period. MT is empty, period. Thank you. <laughs>